Welcome to Crosspoint this morning. I'm Pastor John Scott, and I'm excited that you're joining us for our worship experience today. We are in week five of our series called David And, and each week we've been talking about somebody that has uh, been instrumental in King David's life from the Old Testament. And today, we have hit up Samuel, the prophet Samuel. We're going back to the beginning to see how David became David, and that goes through the prophet Samuel. We're going to hear how his name means to, to hear, to listen, and that's instrumental in understanding who David was, what God wanted from him, and how God works in your life today. But I know right now you have a lot of things on your mind. Uh, this virus is going throughout our communities and the world. There's a lot of fear and anxiety that comes with that. Uh, here, we've been learning about what our school districts are going to do and what kids and teachers and administrators are going to have to do come fall. And there's a lot of anxiety and fear and uncertainty that goes along with that. So today, I'm glad that you're here because I hope that you get a few minutes of focusing on something that you can, something you can rely on in uncertain times. And today I hope that you hear, that you listen to God's word for you, that you hear that he is with you no matter what. And as you hear his voice, that you trust what he's saying to you and what his promises are all about. And finally, that after only we listen and we trust, then we act and we make things happen in our world, not according to maybe what our fear tells us to do, but according to what God asks us to do for the good of his kingdom. So that's what we're going to focus on today at worship, we'll talk about King David and Samuel, and you're going to see how listening, trusting, and acting is instrumental in making this life incredible today. So let's go ahead and start worship. Some songs are going to come on. It's time to get your voices ready to go. I don't know, do you need to do any warm-ups to get that ready? Uh, I usually do. I'm not going to do them on camera for you, but if you ask me in person, I'll show you what I do. And uh, gather your friends and family, text somebody, say you're going to worship right now, and they can log on as well. But really just ready your hearts and your minds to hear this incredible news that there is a God who is with you, he loves you, and that through Jesus he connects himself with you today. It was my nice. 
Something's coming. I can feel it. 
Something's always coming, I guess. Some kind of storm rolling in, always threatening. This looks like another big one. My dad always said, a man's gotta be ready for anything. You do the work, you hunker down, you take care of what's yours. A man don't run when the storm's coming. That's what he said. You be strong, you be the mountain, you don't move. <sighs> he was a mountain, all right. Then he was gone. Sometimes mountains fall. The storm hits, the waters come up fast. Mountains can crumble and slide right off into the sea. I've seen it happen. I'm no mountain, and I'm not standing out here on my own, Dad. I found something stronger. God is my refuge. I don't run away, but I do run to Him. He shows up every time. He helps when it gets bad. Maybe this storm will miss us. Maybe not. Let it come, whatever it is. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not even gonna try to handle it on my own. I've seen what God can do. He is the storm sometimes. He's all the strength I need. He's the real mountain. I won't move as long as I'm with him. So I'm sticking with him, Dad. He is God.
that you are indeed the cornerstone that keeps us strong. Lord, you bring, you bring breath into our lungs. You have called us out of your grave because of your sacrifice. Lord, may this truth that we've sang this morning not only rest upon our minds and our lips, Lord, but sink into our hearts and our souls. Open our hearts and our minds to receive your word this day, and may your Holy Spirit stir within us to put on your love and your confidence. Go ahead of us in the week to come. We pray all of this in your powerful and holy name. Amen. Right now we have a brief moment to give an offering. This is where God's people, as they appreciate what's happening in their lives, as they recognize that God truly owns everything that they have and is a part of, well, giving them the blessings that they have, that we give back a portion of that blessing to him. Uh, through Crosspoint, your donations go to making worship services possible, but also to being blessings in our community, supporting our local food pantry, helping out kids and families get ready for this new school year, whatever it's going to look like. That's where your donations go, so thank you for those. There are a few ways you can give digitally, and those will be on the screen. And as always, you can mail in a donation to our physical address, which will also be on the screen. A quick note, uh, this week we are tearing apart our sanctuary a bit to redo a whole bunch of the audiovisual stuff and lighting things in there based on the donations that you gave to our AV Refresh Fund. So thank you so much for those of you who gave to that fund. Uh, the fruits of that are being put to good use right now, and we hope that by the time we are back live inside our sanctuary, that we'll all be ready to go. So thank you again, and now please uh, take a moment to give your offering. Hey, Crosspointers, it is time to dig into scripture today. We are going back to the beginning of David's story. We're going to 1 Samuel chapter 16. So go ahead and open that up on whatever Bible you've got available to you. Uh, but here's where we're at. We're in week five of our series about King David, this great hero of the Old Testament. Or is he a hero? You have to watch last week's uh, to see what we said about that. King David has done incredible things, but we haven't talked about his origin story. So we're going back to the beginning to see how he actually became king. And this is going to pull in a couple of different characters. First, King Saul, which we've heard before, and also the prophet Samuel, who we haven't come upon yet. So these incredible characters, the prophet Samuel and King Saul, give us the beginning of David's story. Now here's the thing. What we're going to learn today is that when we listen to God, when we trust in him more deeply, and then act on what he calls us to do, incredible things happen. Because this whole David series is about helping us see how imperfect people can do incredible things. So people just like you and me, because we're all imperfect, how can we do incredible things in this world? Well, the main thing we learned today is that when we listen to God, when we trust in his way more than our own, and then act upon that, he will do incredible things. All right, so let's get into this. Uh, First Samuel is all about, um, well, the beginning of the kingships. That's what this book is about. So the first king was King Saul, who united uh, the Israelites. And King Saul was not a great king. Uh, he ended up doing things his own way. In this paradigm of listening, trusting, and acting, his deficiency was in trust. He always seemed to trust his own way more than God's. And this all comes to fruition in the last thing he did as a king, which was to go out and defeat the Amalekites. Here's what God said. Go out and defeat the Amalekites. Don't bring anything back with you. I don't want you to bring back uh, people. I don't want you to bring back gold. I don't want you to bring back animals. Don't bring any of it back. Just go and defeat the Amalekites. So what does Saul do? Well, if it were you or me, if God very clearly said to you, go and do these three things, what would you do? You would go and do those three things. I believe you would. I have no doubt about it. I would do the same thing. But Saul didn't quite trust that. He went out and he defeated the Amalekites because God went with him. God ensured the victory. But you know what else he did? He took the king of the Amalekites, King Agog, and did not defeat him, but instead brought him back in chains. His generals and his soldiers did not listen as well. They didn't well, get rid of all of the sheep and cattle and gold or just leave it. Instead, they brought back some of it with them. I mean, if you know anything about Scripture, when people don't listen to God, how does it work out for them? I mean, think about just your relationship with your parents. If they gave you an instructions, very simple, like, hey, don't run out into the street, 
ride your bicycle on the sidewalk. Um, don't go further than the end of the street. What would happen if you disobeyed one of those? Would it turn out well for you? <laughs> Probably not. We've all been there. We've all done the things that our parents told us not to do. We get caught, we get punished. The same thing happened for King Saul. He came back and the prophet Samuel, the one who spoke for God to the people, looked at what Saul brought back and said, look, these instructions were simple. Go out and win the victory in God's name. He will win the victory for you. Just don't bring anything back with you. And he looks at the king Agog and says, I'm sorry. And then Samuel himself chops off King Agog's head. Oh, should I have given a, a warning here for the younger ears? It's, it, is, it is what it is. It happens in scripture, especially in the Old Testament. Samuel has to take care of Saul's job for him. Anybody love doing that? Taking care of somebody else's job for him? Not so much. Samuel turns to the generals and the people who brought back all of the spoils of war and says, what are you doing? Very simple instructions. Don't bring anything back. And get this. This is what they say. This, this, is, this is a little more difficult. Here's what they say. Well, we left most of it, but the little bit we brought back, we brought back for you. We're going to sacrifice all this to God to give thanks for the victory we had in battle. That sounds pretty good, right? That sounds like a good, uh, a meaningful way to give thanks to God. That's what they did back then. But Samuel says, look, God gave you a simple instruction. Simple. Just don't bring it back with you. Just don't. Have you ever been in that place where you've given people instructions like that that are just very clear? You have your reasons for it. You don't have time to explain all of the whys and the hows of why you've come to that decision, but you just need that person to follow three simple instructions, and they just don't do it. Have you been there? Yeah, I think we've all been there. Now, there's always time for being creative, right? For We all love people who take initiative, right? Who, when you give them a task to do, that they take initiative and they do things in a creative way, and it turns out better than you could ever imagine. But that's when you don't give them three clear, simple boundaries or instructions. That's totally different. King Saul had three instructions. The generals had three instructions. And they couldn't follow it. So frustrating. Why did they do that? It's because they trusted themselves more than they trusted God. King Saul bringing back the king he defeated was a huge boost in his power and his status. The generals bringing back the spoils of war, when they sacrificed them, what did that mean? Well, it meant that they were giving all of that money to the priests and the Levites, to the different groups of people. And the priests and Levites' family would eat off those, that they would have that money, and it was a type of status for them as well. You see, it wasn't quite as selfless act as it seemed. There was always this bit of selfishness in there. Our paradigm today is listening, trusting, and then acting. And we see right here that King Saul and his men, they didn't do it. They didn't do it. So here's what the Bible says. It says that the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul the king. I mean, that's devastating, right? To hear or think that the Lord was sorry that he gave you a job to do because you didn't do it the right way, that's devastating. It's devastating. Now here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that God loved King Saul any less or any more. He still loved him. He still wanted to be connected with him. He still had a plan for him. He still had good things for him in mind. But leadership was going to change. Saul's job was going to change. And this is the same thing that's true in our lives. No matter how we've messed up, no matter how we have not maybe trusted in God in different ways in our lives, no matter how much we have not listened to him, he still loves us incredibly. He loves us so much that he was willing to give up his son just for you, not just for good people you see around you. He gave Jesus for everybody, for people that have done terrible things. He gave his son for you, for me, for all people, so that we could be forgiven. So that we'd be connected with him with this, this connection that knows no boundaries. This connection that just won't be broken by the ways we mess up. That's grace. That's a gift for imperfect people. So that's still there. The love for Saul is still there. But his job has got to change. He can't be trusted to keep leading. That happens in our lives as well. Our purpose, our job, our plans change sometimes because of the consequences of our actions. So this is where, this is the, 
the part where King David enters. Now remember, what's our paradigm today? Listen first, trust more deeply, and then act. Well, Samuel is the one who does this. The prophet Samuel knows that Saul's time has come. He's done being king. The Lord has said this. So the Lord says to Samuel, go find the next king. The next king is going to be one of Jesse's sons. Jesse was a well-known guy. Go to Jesse, and I will show you which one of his sons will be king. This is fascinating. Jesse has seven sons. He lines them all up so that Samuel could check them out, inspect them, and see which one the Lord would want to be king. This almost feels like a reality show today, right? This almost feels like the precursor to The Bachelor or, or any kind of show like that. Which one will Samuel choose? Will he give the rose to you know, whatever? He didn't have a rose. He had a jar of anointing oil that he was going to pour on their head to signify that they would be king. So Samuel checks out all of these sons. The oldest son, the second oldest son, the third oldest son, all the way down to the seventh son. And each time the Lord says to Samuel, nope, that's not the one. It's not the one. He's at the end of his rope. He's at the end of the sons. What is God really leading him to do? Now Samuel has a choice here. He's listened to God. He could choose to trust his own intuition. Because the first son would be a great choice. He's a great leader. He would be a great king. Samuel could anoint that oldest son king. And maybe he'd work out. But he wouldn't have acted as if he trusted in God's, well, direction. Because God said none of these would be the king. So instead, Samuel wants more information. He listens more. He says, God, what should I do? And God says, ask Jesse if he has any other sons. So he asked Jesse, do you have any other sons? These are not the chosen ones. And Jesse reluctantly says, yes, there's the youngest one, but he's out tending the sheep. Samuel says, get him. And sure enough, the younger son, the small one, the runt, the one who was the one that was always made fun of, the one who all the brothers didn't really care for, the one who there was even a hint that maybe Jesse felt like he wasn't really his son biologically, that was David. Up David walks. The Lord says to Samuel, this is the one I've chosen. And Samuel right there takes out that jar of anointing oil and anoints him. That oil pours all over him. The aroma must have been just breathtaking. All the sons look at him. Jesse looks at him. Incredulous. But King David now, well, David, is, he's the king. This is it. Samuel listened. He trusted in God, even though it didn't make sense. And then he acted upon God's will for him. This is the paradigm that David will now take into his kingship. Because as he, as a boy, is anointed to be king, he will have lots of struggles and lots of trials. Because there's already another king on the throne. That king will hate him. That king will chase him and try to kill him. But all the while, David will have to listen to what God wants. He will have to trust that what God desires for his life is what he should desire as well. And this is why, over and over again, David is described as a man after God's own heart. That trust is there. That listening is there. And only after he listens and trusts does he act. Today, we can do the same. I promised earlier that you would be able to have something today that you could stand firm on. That in the uncertainty of everything that's happening right now with the virus that is spreading throughout our communities and the world, with the uncertainty that it comes with an economy that is on the brink, with jobs that are crazy, with schools that are starting in ways that we just don't know or understand how it's going to play out, we feel like we're just standing on shifting and sinking sand. But hear this. Even in the midst of all this, God's promise to you is sure. That he loves you. That he is with you that you are enough for him, that Jesus has made all of this possible. That will always be there, no matter what is happening in your life. But as we relate to others, it may seem a little more difficult. Know that you're secure in your relationship with God, your connection with him. And when you're secure in that, take that into those other realms. Listen to other people. Listen to what they have to say, where their perspectives are coming from. Trust in the people you know you should trust. Trust in God above all, and then trust in the people who he has put in your life to give you that wisdom and that good advice. You, you ever watched a movie and wondered where the bad guy went wrong? It's usually at that point where they, they haven't trusted in the people they know they should. 
where they've gone away from their family or their people that love them unconditionally and they choose a different path. We see that in others. Do we see it in ourselves? Trust in the people God has placed in your lives to give you wisdom, to guide you in the way he will call you, and then act on all of that. Our need today is always to act first. To act first. And that's usually the wrong answer. Listen first. Trust in the people you're supposed to trust in, that God puts in your path, him above all else. And then act based on all of that. When you do this, you're going to change the relationship you have with people, with your boss, with your wife or husband, with your kids. It will all change in such a way that they will see you as somebody who is more patient and kind, who has compassion for them. But it doesn't mean you need to change what you know is right. Because just like as a parent, uh, you give your kid those three simple instructions and they do two of them, but they mess up the third because they've taken their own initiative. They trust in what they think is right and they do it completely differently in a way that messes everything up for you. But they didn't see it. If your first reaction is fear and anger and yelling, you won't build that trust. But if your first reaction is to listen to them, to understand where they came from, to trust that they had good intentions at heart, but also to trust that what you said was to happen. The way you act on that can be really beneficial. They might still get a consequence or a punishment for doing it the wrong way, but they might just see it not as a punitive thing out of anger or fear, but as something that can actually help them be better. Listening, trusting, and then acting is key to relating to others and helping them experience this solid foundation that God builds in our lives. That's David and Samuel. That's the beginning of his story. That's how David starts. So I'm excited to, to finish up this next week with our final story, the most popular and famous story of David. It's the story of David and Goliath. And you're going to see how he makes this real, how he listens to God, how he trusts in God above all else, and then he acts on that. And through that, God builds his kingdom. So let's close with prayer today. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would allow us to trust in you so much that we would first listen to you, that we would trust in your ways above ours, and that we would act on that uh, after we do those things. Let this change our relationships with people around us, that we might listen more compassionately, that we might trust and we know what is right and good, that we might trust in you above all else, but also that we might trust in the people that you've placed in our lives to give us wisdom. And then, Lord, may we act on those. May we act in such ways that show other people your grace and your goodness, that bring joy and peace into this world. Let us act in ways that show your love. In all this we pray that you would keep us in your mercy and your grace through your son Jesus. Amen.
it's really a joy to be able to join you today along with people throughout the world in prayer so let's go ahead and take a moment and uh, go to god with the things that are in our hearts and on our minds let's pray together lord god we come before you today as people who are humbled by your grace that through your servant david through your prophet samuel through your servant saul that we have seen that you are active in our world that you call us to be your people and that even in the midst of our failures and in the midst of our uh, joys and celebrations your love for us remains constant. Your desire for a connection with us is always there. We give you thanks for that. We give you thanks as well that when we mess up, that we are able to turn back to you and receive forgiveness from you. That no matter what we've done, we can always be reconnected with you. We thank you for that gracious love that we don't deserve, that we can't ever earn, but that has been given to us through your son Jesus. We ask that you would allow us to listen hard this week to listen to the people around us, to listen to ourselves, the, the, the inner voices we have, to listen to your spirit working within us, that we might learn more, that we might grow, that we might be influenced by the voices that we are called to trust in our lives. And let us, most of all, trust you a little bit more deeply this week. Let us hear your voice through the voices of others who are inspired by you, through scripture, through prayer. And then, only then, after we've taken time to listen, after we've taken time in our hearts to trust what we've heard, let us then act so that we might act in ways that are good for your kingdom, ways that will bring about good in this world according to the desires of your heart and not necessarily our own. We ask that you would align those desires, though, that we would be changed through this listening and trusting, that we might care more about what you care about than what we do. We know, Lord, that when we do this as a community, that when we do this together, that whole neighborhoods and families and nations are changed for your good. So let us please uh, humble ourselves to do this this week. We ask that you be with those that are struggling and suffering today, that are, are sick and ill. We pray for our medical professionals, our doctors, nurses, and everybody else who is dealing with this pandemic now. We ask that you would allow them to be safe and courageous in the midst of this. Let those who have come to them for healing receive it. We ask that you be with those who are making decisions on our behalf today. It seems like there are new decisions being made every single day. We ask, Lord, that they would be made with integrity, with great honesty, and for the best of the lives of the people who are served by those decisions. We pray that those in positions of authority would not use them for their own benefit, but would do so on behalf of those whom they serve. Remind them of this each day when they wake up and when they go to bed every single day. We pray, Lord, for our neighborhoods, for the people around us each day that we see at stores, that we see in our neighborhoods as we take walks, that we see digitally online, that we, that we know. We pray that you would allow us with kind words and actions to be able to share your grace and your peace with them, that they would know that Jesus is the way to be connected with you that we would encourage that in the lives of so many other people so that their lives would be changed forever. We ask, Lord, that you would work within us powerfully to make this happen, Lord, so that the things that you care about will be the things that we care about. In all this, we ask for your mercy in the ways that we've fallen short. We give you thanks for the ways you've worked through us to change people's lives, and we ask that you would continue to change ours each day. So together, along with Christians throughout the world, we pray together as your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Together with Christians throughout the world and throughout the centuries, we join in saying the Apostles' Creed. This reminds us of God's story, of who he is, and it also reminds us of what we believe and what we stand for, how we're connected with him. So let's go ahead and use these words to confess our faith today. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the forgiveness of saints, the, excuse me, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's good for us together to remember who we are, that we are not perfect people, that we are all imperfect, but we have a God who forgives us. And we stand on that promise. In times of anxiety, in times of trouble, in times of uncertainty, we don't stand on our own two feet. We stand on God's promises. So let's confess our mistakes together and then hear his promise to us. We confess. Almighty God, you are the loving Father who seeks us out every day. We confess that we have been selfish with the things you've given us. We confess that we have not been compassionate to our neighbors. Forgive us for running away from you. Call us back with your unfailing love. Connect us again through Jesus' love poured out for us upon the cross. And by your Holy Spirit, let us show our neighbors who you truly are through compassion and unfailing love. Amen. That's our confession of the ways that we've fallen short of what God has called us to do. But we've listened, we've trusted, and now we act. And God says to us to give us encouragement along the way to remind us of his promise, to align his heart to ours. He says to you today, you are forgiven. Everything that you brought up and thought of that weighed you down, let it go. Because you are forgiven through Jesus' blood and through his resurrection. It's a gift to you. So receive it and let it encourage you this week as you go and be people in his kingdom. Amen. As we close out today, our worship time together, we have one more song to sing, so stick around. Uh, but a couple announcements, things that are happening in our community, want to make sure you know what's going on. First of all, if you're celebrating something today, a, a birthday, anniversary, anything, uh, let us know in the comments, and we would love to celebrate that with you. Um, a couple of announcements. We always have service here right on our property outside at 9 a.m. Central Time uh, right here. So come and enjoy that. Socially distance, uh, masks on. Everybody here is wearing masks. Uh, you'll be far enough away if you're just sitting with your family. You don't need to wear one. Uh, but we follow all the rules. Uh, but we do want to just have this time to be together. It's so great to see other people. So we encourage you, uh, join us here for 9 a.m. service right here at Cross Point. Other than that, uh, we are here online together at 9 a.m. and 10.30 every Sunday morning. And also, we've started replaying the service at noon on our website and every hour following noon all day long. So if you didn't get a chance to make it in the morning or maybe you slept in, uh, you can catch the replay every hour right at our website uh, and enjoy uh, this great weekend message. Um, I think other than that, that's all we've got going for this week. It's the middle of summer. I uh, hope you're enjoying the outside. I hope you're enjoying uh, a little bit of the summerness. It's a little different this year. That's fine. Uh, but I hope you're enjoying the weather. Um, but we're looking forward to fall as well. More stuff is going to start happening sooner in the next few weeks. And we look forward to finding ways that we can be a community together. A church who is on a mission to help more people live that best life that they want to live connected with God this um, this fall. So that's going to be exciting. And I'm excited for it. I'm excited that you get to join us in that. So as we go, um, receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. All right. It's time to listen. It's time to trust. It's time to act. And our last act together is to sing this last song. So let's sing and we'll be ready for a great week in God's kingdom. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace.